I'm here with Zach Tellender today, strength coach, uh, YouTube phenom, and overall strong guy. So we're here to get his perspective on uh, strength training, Olympic weightlifting, CrossFit, and several other things. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Zach. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's uh, It's been a good day so far. Um, just got done with training, rushed back here to get on the show. Yeah, I mean, you practice what you preach. I've seen uh, tons of your YouTube videos of you training yourself, training with uh, athletes that you work with and things like that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what your current training looks like, what your goals are, and, and how you program things for yourself? So I think that, like, to kind of go on what you were saying, practice what you preach, I think in strength training, there's really no better way to, like, uh, to coach and to understand the process other than putting yourself through it, it, it might be one of the most important things. So I always, I always say like, as a coach, like, um, there are three pillars to, to whether you're a good coach or not. And it's, what have you done with yourself? Meaning like, if, have you taken your numbers from here to there? What, what is that? Uh, what have you done with others? So have you taken someone else's numbers to, to something else? And then what's your formalized education or how are you continuing your education? So I think, you know, of those three, like putting yourself through it and what have you done with yourself is the most important. So that's like, I'll never miss an opportunity to train and work out and, and get better at what I do. Um, I think it, as far as my own training goes right now, um, you know, I've never really been one to have like goals, if that makes sense. Like I've always just figured I want to get better at whatever I'm doing. Um, right now I do though, which is a rare thing. I do have a goal of a 300 kilo deadlift. So I've been doing a lot of more strength-based training. I, I come from a background of Olympic weightlifting. So it's been a lot of deadlifting, a lot of squats, a lot of bench press, more powerlifting style movements. And where's your deadlift at now? Uh, so my best ever deadlift is 280 kilos. And, uh, so, and that, that's a, a conventional deadlift. So that's with your feet inside your hands. Uh, and then actually yesterday I just did sumo deadlifting for the first time in, in like three years. And I, and I did 272. Uh, and so I don't know, I, the goal is 300 kilos conventional, but I might be able to get it sumo. Um, and yeah, it's, it's arduous, man. It's tough. Like it's, it's getting more and more tough by the day. Yeah. It's heavy pool. I, I had a stint in powerlifting, um, probably like six or seven years ago. Now I, I did it for a few years and I think the most I ever pulled was just a little bit North of 500 pounds. I'm not great at the kilo conversion, but, uh, it was, it was a real grind to get there. I don't think I was the most genetically gifted in terms of, of my ability to pull heavy deadlifts, just cause like, especially in conventional, just cause like my different lever arms and things like that. But I, I definitely had to grind out every little bit of progress, even to crack that 500 pound barrier. And, uh, I just saw a YouTube video of you repping out 500 pounds. So, uh, you're, you're definitely no slouch, man. You're, you're grinding it out. Yeah. I've, I've always been a like, as far as my lifting goes, deadlifting has always been like my specialty. I think, I think I'm, I'm more built for that. Uh, but even then there's a, there's a part of training where the proverbial rubber hits the road, you know, um, you're not getting the gains that you're used to. You're not progressing like you're used to. And that's where you start to question if it's even possible, what you want to do. And you just, show up to the gym and you have to find different ways. And I think that is the most special part of training because you have to uh, get creative, but you also have to be consistent. There's, it's like a fine line. Creativity is like novelty, you know, go out and try something different. What have you not done? Um, but at the same time, you can't always be novel. You, you, you have to, um, you know, you, you have to be consistent, you know, what's going to get you stronger and uh, you have to be disciplined in that. So it's a very, very strange balance. And I think the best of the best are always the ones who can balance the two. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so in terms of novelty versus consistency, like an example I would think of would be getting your reps in with your deadlifts, right? Just your from the floor pulls 
And then the more novel stuff, like maybe doing a deadlift, standing on plates or with bands or something to try to like build your strength in different um, areas of the lift. Is that kind of what you're referring to? Yeah. Well, it's not even just that it's like the novel stimulus more psychologically. So like yesterday would have been a great example of this. Um, two days ago I went in, I was like, okay, I need to have a big deadlift session. Like if I want to do 300 kilos, I got to do this. And I couldn't even get, you know, 585, which is, um, nowhere near 300 kilos. It's like, uh, I think it's like 275 or no, no, sorry, 265. So I was sad, you know, I was like, wow, you're not progressing. Like you thought you would have been. And, uh, I was like, you know what? So yesterday, the following day, I was like, I'm going to go back to the gym and I'm going to deadlift. I'm just going to move, try to get a lot of volume in. And one of my buddies was there and he's like, I'm going to squat. Uh, and I was like, you know, I wanted to deadlift, but I'm going to squat with this guy. And uh, it was cool to have somebody watching me squat, having, having this pressure. And I was filming my sets and I was like, you know what? I just want to move fast. And I ended up having a really good squat session. And then after that, he's like, I'm going to do some deadlifts. So I'm like, okay, I'll do some deadlifts with you. And he's like, but he pulls sumo. So I never pull sumo. Like literally three years ago was the last time. So I'm like, you know what? Here's some novelty. Let's just go in and, uh, and practice sumo deadlifting. There's zero pressure. There's zero level of consistency. It's all novelty. So then I went and I did it and I got this huge boost uh, because I hit a massive PR in a, in a lift I don't train, but there's that novelty. Like I was able to get more out of my body yesterday because I added in that novel stimulus, that novel motivation. Um, then maybe I would have had I just been consistent, if that makes sense. But that, that does not mean that, you know, I should do that all of the time. And that's kind of more the balance that I, I was talking about. Of course, you can do novel exercises that will uh, like variants that will help you in the main lift, but those are still along the lines of consistency because you're not really looking for that ego boost, if you will. Um, it is nice to change environment and to change psychological factors. Those are things that I'm very interested in doing. Um, having been training for a long time, I think that's, that's really what I look out for. When, where can I train with someone new? What, you know, where can I learn something? Where can I get that pressure, that outside stimulus that will get me uh, to, to have a good session? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think that a lot of people can un underestimate the role those psychological motivators can play. And uh, I know in my own like athletic endeavors, oftentimes, like if I have the opportunity to do something with someone who's more skilled or knowledgeable than me, I try to take it up because I've had people just tell, tell me like a single sentence that's like changed the game. And yeah. it's just, you know, their depth of knowledge or, or skill is better than me. Uh, for one, but two, they're also watching what I do from an outside perspective and maybe, you know, pointing out that I'm moving in a way that's inefficient or doing something that could be done better. And like, once you kind of like unlock that perspective, uh, the game can change uh, and get you kind of like more excited about going back to your original, your original goal. So no, I think that's some, that's some really valuable perspective there. Um, well, I mean, it's awesome that you're working towards that yourself, but why don't you give us a bit of background on your you know, your athletic career before you were a coach and what led to, to this, uh, passion for coaching people. So I played a multitude of sports growing up. I, I played like everything under the sun. My dad played football in college and then he was drafted to the Kansas city chiefs. My sisters all swam, uh, very competitively. And, uh, I was a swimmer for a little bit as well. And then I just branched out and didn't have it in me at like 13 years old to really commit to swimming. So, um, I was playing lacrosse, football, basketball, and then I was like running track and field. I was doing some like swimming and I was doing diving, which is kind of crazy. Um, but then I got to high school and I was getting recruited to play football or lacrosse. I ended up getting a pretty bad knee injury my senior year. And before that I'd even I committed to playing lacrosse at the university of Vermont. It's a division one program and uh, they're actually doing pretty well recently. They've gone to the NCAA tournament, I think two years in a row, which is pretty cool. Uh, but that's where strength training really changed for me. I mean, I, I did it in football in high school. Um, and then in college we were like really regimented. So we would, 
get in the weight room four times a week year round, basically. And then, um, after college, you know, I just got a job at, at like an advertising agency and I thought to myself, well, this can't really be it as far as your athletic endeavors. Like it can't be completely over. And, um, I saw some men's journal or some men's fitness article online and it was talking, it was talking about Rich Froning and, uh, like this workout that he had done and they called it CrossFit. And I was like, wow, that sounds pretty awesome. You know, he's ripped. This is a, something that I can compete in and I can go hard and push myself. So, um, I, I called a gym in my area and they hadn't even opened yet. So they're like phone lines weren't even up. So then I called the one over and the guys are like, yeah, come on in and, and train. And so I, I started training there and that one decision going to the other gym that was like a little bit further away like set me on this course to become a coach, which is wild to think about. Like who knows what would have happened if I had gone to that original gym. And be because these guys were football players and they were competitive themselves and they uh, got really into Olympic weightlifting and we were doing pretty much Olympic style weightlifting, like almost every session. And then we would do like a, a CrossFit workout on top of that. So that's where I really got the itch to like get into Olympic style weightlifting. This was around 2014. And then uh, slowly but surely, I wanted to do training more than I wanted to work. So I, start, I, I got my CrossFit level one. I got my USA weightlifting level one. Um, I started coaching on the side. And then I got a full-time coaching job as a CrossFit coach. I started a weightlifting club at this CrossFit gym. And this was down in Chicago. It's crazy to have a job, by the way, like a, a CrossFit coaching job where you were salaried. Most of the time, they just give you a, an hourly wage. Like every class you coach, you get like 30 bucks or something. But I had an actual salary, which is crazy. Um, and then after doing that for about a year and a half, I, I just... I wanted, I had this itch to, to get into performance because like the whole time I was coaching CrossFit, I was so into getting people to perform better. And I, that was more in line with what I wanted rather than, uh, you know, the community, the fitness aspect, which are all good things, but just personally, I was, was so into performance. So I, um, applied for an internship at Northwestern university in strength and conditioning. And that just set me on a different path. I was an intern at Northwestern for a year that was unpaid. So I was up at the crack of dawn in the gym, helping out with athletes, uh, helping out with training as anywhere I could completely unpaid. Um, thank God I was able to live rent free at the time. And, uh, then I got a pretty good opportunity at Texas A&M. It was like a, an apprenticeship or kind of like an assistant strength and conditioning coach with Olympic sports over there. I moved to College Station and then I was there for the next year. I got uh, my CSCS, which is a, a certified strength and conditioning coach. It's a, it's a pretty big, um, what, do we, what do you call it? Uh, like license to, to coach, uh, strength and conditioning. And then, uh, I got my USA weightlifting level two, which is just like an advanced sports coach and then CrossFit level two, because I didn't want that to expire after, uh, working at Texas A&M, I kind of started to get into this, uh, YouTube thing. Somebody had, somebody had mentioned to me that like YouTube was a place where people like shared videos that it, it wasn't just viral videos. Like there were things such as YouTubers and this was kind of late to the game to, to define this out. But I just like, I thought YouTube was where people just put viral videos, you know, I didn't, and I also didn't understand the whole idea of like a YouTuber. Um, this was about, this was 2016. My first video was in April of 2016. And so what I did was I made some videos and I put them on Reddit. I put them on uh, CrossFit Reddit because they were me kind of doing CrossFit and weightlifting style videos. And some feedback I got on the CrossFit Reddit page really, again, helped mold 
who I am today. And one of, one of the, the biggest feedbacks was like, Hey man, um, I appreciate the work you put into this video, but like, you have to like wonder why would we want to watch this? And he's like, you're not like a, 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 a sex icon. You're not, you're not like a good, like freaky, good looking dude. You're also not like exceptionally good at CrossFit and we don't know what your goals are. So why would we follow you? It's one thing if you're an incredibly good looking person, like you don't have to have that much substance. You just have to show yourself off and people will be like, okay, I'll watch that. If you're incredibly talented, like incredibly talented, all you have to do is just show yourself training. You don't even have to speak. But if you're neither of those things, you have to have some sort of substance. And I first read that and I was like, kind of like, screw this guy. But it had such truth to it. And one thing that he said, like, completely changed everything. He said, what are you good at? Like, specifically, that, that not many other people are. And I was like, oh, coaching, weightlifting. In the CrossFit space, I know, I know there are things that people are not saying that can help people snatch and clean and jerk. And in the weightlifting space, too. So that was my, I, I took down the other videos. There were these vlogs. There were sh shitty, shitty vlogs. And um, I took them down and I put up my first weightlifting video. Uh, I remember I got uh, emails every time I got a subscriber. And I got 25 emails. And uh, I got like 700 views or something. And I was stoked. I was just like, this is amazing. So I repeated that process of putting one video up per week. And now I put up like three, four, five, sometimes six videos per week. But I did that for the next six years. And here I am today. So, so now I have 172,000 subscribers, you know, and, and over 31 million views. But it started six years ago after all of that. And that level of I will not miss a video per week for the next six years uh, to where I am now. Sorry, that was long winded, but <laughs> no, it's all good, man. I think that's, that's really excellent background. And, and there's a lot of like admirable takeaways from that. I mean, the, the one being the level of consistency, you know, you've maintained that, that posting cadence for the last six years to build the following you have the day. And it's like, I think sometimes people can look at uh, you know, whether it's building YouTube following or building a lot of strength or whatever, um, they can look at people that are, you know, really talented or have really good results and think that, that if it doesn't go like that for them, then it's not going to happen at all. But I mean, you've built a really respectable following and a really respectable career. And it took you consistency over a long period of time. I mean, I guess it depends on how you define long, but for, for a lot of people, six years would be a long time. And uh, just sticking to it kind of got you there in the end. And I mean, I, I think that's awesome. And I think it, I, I talk with a lot of high level athletes and there's always this, you know, dichotomy between, okay, we take, you know, Rich Froning or whoever. It's like how much of it was just raw innate talent and how much of it was hard work. And uh, sometimes some people are just insanely talented and just insanely gifted genetically. But I think a lot of times the component that people don't realize is that, you know, if you decide, hey, today I want to start doing X sport, it's like, well, you're starting at square one. You know, even even like a lot of these athletes that, that have had a lot of success are usually starting as, you know, early adolescents or even children. And it's like just that amount of time that they've had to make those mistakes and grind it out and build all that foundation um, leads up to them being a phenom. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm sure your YouTube channel will continue to grow in a more exponential fashion, but it's getting to that point where, you know, 10% of zero is a very small number, 10% of 172,000, 17,000 people. So, you know what I mean? Like, even if you just maintain 10% growth, it kind of like scales exponentially. And I feel like the same thing can kind of apply to strength sports in a way too, or, or any sports really is like, if you, you know, once you have training age in and you, the more knowledge you accumulate and the better you get at training and the more skill you have, um, the more you're able to kind of like stack those skills and compound your results into being, uh, a stronger athlete. Yeah. You, so look, every person has to have a win. I think, I think it's like 
you know, if I if I kept doing the same vlogs, would I have ever won? Maybe I would have. Maybe maybe it could have worked out in some way, in some capacity, or maybe I would have given up before it. But what allowed me to then go on and be very consistent was that initial win that I had the 25 emails. So I got an email. I don't know why this feature was a thing. I would get an email every time I got a subscription, 25 emails, like this person subscribed, you know, and 700 views. That was my win. And I was like, can I win again? Can I do that again? Let's try it next week. Oh, I did it again. Let's do it next week. Let's do it next week. Boom, 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 boom. Right. I found what works and then I hammer the shit out of it. Literally do not give up re- relentlessly hitting it. And then I, there was a point, I think it was about six or seven months ago where I d- decided I wanted to change things up a bit. I wanted to open up my channel to talking about other things. And since that point, I have talked about different sports not you know it started as strictly olympic style weightlifting that's how it started and that's where it stayed for years and then now i opened up the conversation to a lot of other things because i am a person and so when i get people to care about me they can care about my ideas even though it isn't within my niche if that makes sense and i think if we if we want to look at training you have to get that win before you can become disciplined at least that's what I believe. There has to be that glimmer of like, whoa, this is cool. This is awesome. What, what is possible? I can see what's possible, right? And so that might be like your first pump when you get into the gym or the first time you back squat, you're like, oh my God, this is crazy hard. I'm like wiggling around. And then, you know, you have a nice session, you get really warm and then you back squat a hundred pounds and you're like, holy shit, I've never back squatted before. And I back squatted a hundred pounds. Like what could happen a year from now? So that's that win. And that is the motivation. But on the other side of the spectrum is the discipline and the discipline doesn't really matter until shit hits the fan or the rubber meets the road until you hit that wall. And you're like, wait a minute, I don't know if this is it for me. I don't know if I can make it to that goal. And that's the discipline aspect. The, one of the greatest underrated videos that displays discipline, there was a weightlifter named Zachary Critch. Zachary Critch, yeah. And he was training at the Olympic Training Center when it, was, when it existed. And he was, doing a hang, he was doing a hang clean or a clean with straps, which is – Usually you don't want to do that. Okay. Because you're locked into the bar and now you can't let go of it to, to save yourself. You know, if you fall or yeah. something happens and this is when the bar is in the front rack. Now you can do cleans with straps when you want to do power cleans. And sometimes you'll see people squat, but this is like, they never really grind and they're still able to get out. So what happened with Zachary Critch was he might, you know, something, it was a, it was an accident. And he fell back with both of his hands strapped in and fractured both of his arms. Okay. He, he, and he made this into a video. It's an unbelievable video. And I, I've always planned on making a YouTube video. Maybe this is going to motivate me to make one. Um, but all the, all doctors, everyone was like, yo, just stop weightlifting. Like, it's just not going to happen. Like he had his, his um, wife had to wipe his ass like repeatedly for like three months. He, he had basically straight arm casts in both of his arms. And uh, he showed his rehab while he was doing it. Basically, was like, all right, I'm just not going to be a weightlifter anymore. And in that moment, it is so far, it is so unbelievably impossible for him to see himself ever performing at the level he did before or, or better. It's so impossible to see it and believe it that you have to make this decision. Like, am I going to pursue this thing again or am I not? And so he decided, you know, I'm going to go for it. What's the worst that could happen? I try. Is that really that bad? So he worked for another year and a half or two years, whatever, basically snatching a, 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 you know, 15 pound bar and working all the way up to surpassing both of his numbers and becoming national champion again. 
And this video like was so eye opening to me because there is some innate thing where people just they can they can they block out the idea that the finish line might not be there. And that is discipline. That's it. It's like the finish line may or may not be there, but I just, I don't fucking care. I'm going to go. I have to go work. I have to go train. I have to do this. And then, like, who knows how much of that is genetic, but I, I, all I can say is like, that is where we focus more on discipline. You have to get to being able to be disciplined or, or where discipline really matters because the motivation completely fades away. Yeah, no, I think that's an awesome story. I'll have to find that Zachary Critch guy and have him on the podcast. That sounds like it'd make a fantastic interview. But uh, yeah, no, dude, nobody knows about this guy either. I mean, this happened in probably 2013 or 14. And it's one of the most motivating videos I think I've ever seen. And, yeah. and no one knows who he is. It's totally uh, an underrated video. No, yeah. I mean, I think there's like several good takeaways from that in the sense that, you know, the the actual like, direct example of overcoming injuries makes a lot of sense. Uh, and we talk about that, but the other example of just bringing in the consistency and kind of like moving forward with a plan, even though you don't know what the outcome is going to be like, or if you'll even achieve the desired outcome, or like you said, if you ever get to the finish line, I know that for all the high level athletes I talk to, and even like my own athletic hobbies, it's like the consistency always produces results. Even if like you mentioned in the beginning of this interview um, that you had a deadlift session that didn't go that great according to your end goals and you didn't lift as much as you would like to. But it's like, I've had plenty of workouts like that. And sometimes it's hard to pin down, especially as you like, you know, I'm 33 now and I have a wife and two kids and a business and my hobbies and it can all pile on. It's like, I never really know if I'm going to sleep much or how my workout's going to go that day. But, uh, some night, some days I'll just wake up and be like, oh, I didn't sleep all this, this workout's going to suck and I'll crush it. You know, just, you don't know why. And, and then other days it doesn't go according to plan. But if I stay consistent a year out, you know what I mean? Six months out a year out, I, I have always made progress. Maybe not as much progress as I wanted to, but always some level of progress. And I'm always stronger than I was six months ago, as long as I maintain that consistency. So I think there's a lot to be said for, for kind of, you know, sticking to the plan and sticking to your, to your workouts, regardless of how it's feeling in the moment. And then, uh, in, in terms of, of the injury aspect of it, like I have a, a good buddy that I, um, do a lot of my athletic stuff with, and he's a physical therapist full time. And like, yeah, man, every, every time like, he's an athlete. So he comes from this background of like, you know, return to function is return to your athletics, like being able to do what you did before and go past that. And it's like the amount of, of consoles he's had of people that were told they were never going to be able to achieve their athletic skin. They were going to have to quit. They were going to have to do this and that. Um, I mean, it happens all the time. And the people that it, like he'll tell you straight up, like the people that just choose, they make the decision that I am going to keep doing this. They pretty much always do. You know what I mean? They're, they're able to return. So um, he, I'm sure he's heard of the biopsychosocial model of um, physical therapy and, and training and, and basically physiology. And there is a, a great one of my friends, his name's Sam Spinelli. Uh, and he's written a paper on the biopsychosocial model of, of how rehabilitation and, and physiology works. And it's gotten like 2 million uh, clicks. On, it, it was like a blog post. Um, and it's like really changed the landscape a lot. And the biopsychosocial model is like, so biologically, when you injure something, what's happening to cause you pain or dysfunction? right? That's the actual biological thing. Like if you tear a muscle, there's a biological, there's something physically happening there, but then there's the psychological aspect. And that is, um, the, the feeling that you've lost what you had and you can't get it back or, or the ability of your mind to control, uh, what steps you take forward or what you're capable of. And that goes in line with the social aspect and the social one is very interesting if you are in a uh, a, a a social setting uh, whether that be an office or the way that the discourse works in in your practice and you're a physical therapist 
if your social setting says something, it can affect you. So uh, a great example is like, if you are in a social setting where you're a physical therapist, right? And you have all these really white walls and you have this stale uh, kind of medical looking uh, setup. The table has like the shitty paper on top of it that you sit on and it smells weird. And you are going to walk into that thing place and you're going to be like, oh, I'm at the doctor's because I'm broken because I'm I need to be fixed. Right. Rather than being like, hey, I'm going to a specialist who's going to make me strong, who's going to make me able. Right. There's something going on, but I'm not worried. And that's all because of the social setting that you are in you know they they have like the spines that they're like fake yeah. spines and they like they're all contorted and they're like look at how messed up your spine is you're so broken you know that absolutely affects the psychology and in and what we're trying to learn is like the actual biology of that person and their training and um so so yeah like that falls directly in line and so i think the main thing people have to do is like it, it is very important that physical therapists are, they're in the mindset of progression and not in the mindset of putting people down because of their dysfunction or something that they don't like about what they do, right? It's like, I went to a doctor and I was like, oh, look at my knee. It's so messed up because I'm missing a medial meniscus on my right side. I got it taken out when I was in high school. And I was like, oh, I've got this arthritis, like a seven-year-old, don't I? And, he, and the guy was like, screw that. You're fine, dude. You don't feel anything. You're all right. Get stronger. Go train. This is my doctor. And I was like, hell yeah. You know, like, and this guy wasn't even a, like a big, strong dude. He just knew how important the psychology of this is. And, and I, ever since then, like it, it's, it's really changed a lot for me. Yeah, that's a good doctor. Um, like talking back about my PT friend, I'll have to have him on the podcast too, but he, he's, done specialties in like pain science and things like that. And he'll tell you straight up, but that like in his, in his like, you know, doctorate level studies, they'll do studies where they'll take MRIs basically like, you know, do like blind setups and you can look at the MRI of one person and their MRI will look terrible and they'll be functionally pain free. And you can look at another MRI and their, their, their like spinal damage or arthritis or whatever will be minor and they'll be in a ton of pain. And so like, there's obviously this external component that you don't know about. And I think that that attitude aspect is, is probably a huge part of it. Like good on your doctor for saying that. I think that's really awesome. Yeah. And um, I, I think the mindset component of it all plays, plays into everything more than people think. Cause uh, you know, when we were uh, prepping for this interview with you, we just asked people like, Hey, what do you want to know from Zach? You know, we have this great coach coming on and a lot of people asked, they wanted to say like, well, how much of building strength is training and skill and how much of it is genetics? And I'll let you weigh in on that. But I think that obviously genetics play a role, but you know, if you want to take people and, you know, from an athletic ability, put them on a scale of one to 10. So one just being like a guy who works in an office and has never done any exercise and considers himself not an athlete at all. And then 10 being world-class athlete. I think genetically, everyone is capable of being like, you know, six to 10. You can all do really well. You can all be a capable athlete. Uh, now the gap between you and an Olympic level athlete might be vast, but the gap between you and that guy who's just sitting in an office chair doing nothing ever will be bigger. You know what I mean? Anyone is capable of, of some pretty impressive stuff if they set their mind to it. And I think that part of the reason people never achieve that stuff is, is like you're pointing out, they get trapped in this mindset of like, oh, I'm not that guy. I can't do that. I'm not athletic. But really, if they put some effort into it and dedicated themselves to it, I bet you they would be shocked they could achieve. So, yeah, I, I love this conversation. I have it. I have it often, and I've have a few theses or theses that I that I love to talk about. But have you ever like, like first off, I think performance is just all encompassing, um, and I think that every human has performance needs all day, every day, and there are some men and women out there that by our metrics, by our standards, we wouldn't be able to tell that they're performing at an incredibly high level. But if you sit and watch them and see what they do, you're like, oh my God, this person's a freak. You know, like um, if I see someone who has 
you know, a wife and kids, good house is not in credit card debt, uh, has like, you know, wakes up early in the morning, works on their fitness, eats right, has like, you know, is relatively stress-free. I think of that person as an, as an incredibly high performer, right? And so there absolutely are genetic factors to that person being able to do what they do. There are absolutely training factors that allow that person to be able to do what they do. But there's also the psychological factor and all of those things, like you would never think to, to, to look at that person as a performer, as someone who, need, you know, but I, I guess where I'm going with this is like, we're, we, it's very difficult to determine what like genetics actually means and, and, and what these different factors are because we're all performing, you know, you can't say one person always does everything better than this person because everyone performs in something different. Now, if we're looking at training, which we are, um, I love to look at this at the lens of martial arts because what you can pin are, well, first, let me explain. I think of like a triad, okay, of what is necessary to be an optimal athlete. And uh, the first thing we're going to see is physiology. Um, and so physiology is like, you know, the physical genetic gifts that you get without training, um, you know, bone structure, muscle fiber type, uh, you know, your ability to metabolize protein and, and perform just straight out of the womb. That's your physiology. Um, and then you have technique and, and, and technique is the, uh, you know, the specialization of whatever it is that you want to do. And so to, to have that physiology change, it's, it takes training. You know, you have to go to the gym and get stronger, bigger muscle fibers, whatever. You might be able to have heavier axial loads so that you can, um, change your bone structure a little bit. You know, you can actually, uh, increase bone density from strength training. But if you think about technique, technique is very simple because it's just a, a bunch of progressions and regressions. So uh, I think of this in martial arts, and I love using the example uh, of jujitsu, something that I practice. I know Martins actually practices a little bit too. Um, but doing what's called a triangle choke, it's not difficult at all because there are simple steps that literally almost every human can do. If I walk you through it step by step by step, almost every human can do those steps. They're not hard at all, but to do them in succession and to do them almost intuitive, intuitively and to set it up so that you can do it and to do it up fast enough, that's what takes skill. So you have that technical aspect and you have to produce so much volume into that technical aspect. So we have, we have physiology, we have technique. But the third one that not many people talk about is the psychology. And the psychology is this, it's almost like this je ne sais quoi. Like you can't really wrap your head around it, but you can feel it. You can sense it within someone. I have a couple of good examples of, of people who have this uh, aspect, but psychology is going to be grit, discipline, determination, all of the things that, you know, we had talked about prior, like that Zach Critch, he had the psychology aspect. How much of the genetic? How much of the physiological? Well, you know, pretty good. But the psychology was damn good. Where does that come from? Does that come from genetics? Where, you know, are you born like that? Maybe, probably, right? So that is an important aspect that people really need to hone in on. Because in order to be the best, you have to have all three. But in order to be pretty good, you have two. And maybe one of them is lacking a little bit. The coolest thing about martial arts, and this is what we see a lot, is we have, two, we have people who specialize in two of those three and they're opposite or, or you know, so what we'll see is like a, a guy who's highly skilled and technically solid and he's, and he's got the mentality, you know, but then you have somebody who is physiologically, you know, jacked, strong, explosive. And he's, um, he's got this mental ability to just push through. So now you have the, the technically guy, the technical guy, but you have the, 
the big jack guy. And in martial arts, we see this all the time. And they clash. And we see who wins. And it's kind of a coin toss, right? But if you had somebody who was equally as good at all three, they're beating the guy that's good at just two. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Right? So this is what I'm fascinated by. Um, the, uh, the ADCC just happened yesterday. It's the biggest grappling tournament in the world. And this guy that I know really well, his name's Yuri Samos. I would consider him a friend. Um, he is now three-time ADCC champion. And he is so under the radar. You know, he's physically pretty big dude and he's pretty jacked. But he's not the most technical and he's definitely not the biggest dude and not the most jacked. But his psychology, he is a pit bull. He is relentless. He does not care. Um, our professor at, at the school that I train at, he's like, you know, Yuri has never been the biggest and he has never been the most capable uh, technically. But he does not give up. And what I think about with guys like Yuri, is there, is there some sort of genetic thing there? Right? And when everyone talks about genetics, we talk about how someone looks, how big they are, how high they can jump. But do we talk about the guys that just have that, that innate, just fucked up go mentality that just, they can't turn it off? Not, not really. You know, and, and this is what, this is just, I'm fascinated by this. I could literally talk about this all day long and come up with examples here and examples there. Yeah, no, I think that there's, I, I think that probably makes the most sense of any, like, you know, theory or whatever you want to call it. I've heard on what makes a high level athlete, like having all three of those components, because you never see a elite level athlete, you know, world-class that's missing that psychological component. And obviously to be world-class, they also have the genetics and the technique down. Um, but kind of like that missing that, that X factor psychologically is like, like a, a heavy degree of commonality between everyone that's performing at a world-class level. And I think like the, you know, one of the takeaways from that is that for, for people that are listening that are like more on the normal end of the athletic spectrum, um, I think that 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 kind of like triad, as you want to call it, is really empowering in the sense that like, you know, your own genetics, you may never know what those limits are, especially depending on when you started in life um, pursuing your athletic hobbies. And it's like, in, in my mind, obviously they matter, especially if you're like trying to be a professional athlete or something like that. But if you're not and you're just doing this for fun, like I do, you do it as a combination of like fun and a career, but your own athletic pursuits are largely just, you know, um, self-fulfilling. It's like, I almost don't even care about my genetics because you, like you said, you could be a high level athlete just based on those other two, just the technique and the psychology of it. And those, like, obviously the psychology could have a genetic component, but you also have a lot of control over those things. You can practice get, to get better and you can practice your mindset. And, um, like I, I'm sure that there is a genetic component, uh, of the people that just have that like grit determination, like, like you called it a pitbull attitude. Uh, and I've seen it with with athletes that I've trained with and worked with and things like that. But I also think part of it is learned as well in the sense that like the guys I know that are really like that, they just put that level of effort into every single training session, even when they don't feel good. And it's not like they're oh they always have the best attitude. Like sometimes they'll show up at the gym and and they're they they're like, man, I didn't sleep good. I don't feel great, but I don't care. I'm gonna get after it anyways. And they give it 110% no matter what. Even if they're having an off day and that 110% effort results in less weight lifted or whatever, they're still gonna give it everything they got. And because they practice like that and they train like that, when they go to perform, that's how they perform, just giving it everything and leaving it all out there. So I think that's really cool. So this is something that I would suggest for, you know, the average gym goer, which, you know, whoever, whomever would, would see this. Um, and that is, you know, to really think about novelty and discipline and, and just uh, a, a saying that I say all the time, and this can really help you out is having low expectations, but high standards. So, what happens when you become disciplined in something, and, and I've seen this trend happen a lot, is that you expect a result, right? And, and that idea of expecting, like anything is given to you or deserved, like you deserve to get this thing, is a poison to your mind. And um, 
you know, in training, you become very disciplined. You bench, squat, deadlift, bench, squat, deadlift. I want this total. I expect this total of lifts. But what happens when you plateau? And it seems impossible to break through that plateau. What will you do then? There has to be something that you can switch to lower your expectations. Uh, and I would say it in, in like, like you're outsourcing your expectations. So for instance, when you introduce novelty, you don't expect shit because this is novel. And then you perform it and you go, wow, I just had a great session. And that actually, that's artificially making you more disciplined. That's artificially taking you to the next level over and over again. And this is, um, this is what I co commonly do in, with nutrition. Uh, because that is the one aspect where it's like, I just, my whole life, I won't miss training. I love to go to the gym, right? But I, I don't really care too much about nutrition. Um, so then I go, okay, you know what? I want to dial it in nutrition. This is what I want to do. All of a sudden, my expectations in the weight room go down. Not because I'm losing weight, not because I'm losing strength, but because I just don't care that much about it. I care about this nutrition thing. So what I'll do is I'll be like, I need to hit this protein macro. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wake up in the morning and my, my, a lot of times my morning meal is um, hard boiled eggs, fruit, and then I'll try to have some chicken or something else to like get a higher protein spike because eggs really don't have that much protein. Com, you know, contrary to popular belief. Um, and then having done that, that sets me up to go, okay, now I'm going to go train. And then right after training, I'm going to make sure I get a high protein meal. And I usually have fruit for carbs. I have fruit for my carbs all the time. Um, and I, I've been doing this more like protein and fruit kind of combination. It's been really good for me. Um, and, you know, over the next two weeks, I notice results just in two, three, four weeks of just like dialing it in as much as I can and, and not really expecting much from anywhere else in my life. And the coolest thing is I get this straight up results right away. And I go, okay, every time I do something like that, I can get a little bit more consistent in the next phase of my life, right? I'll remember those days where I was eating the right way. And maybe next time I go eat, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly looking for protein. I take those lessons I learned from switching up what I focus on and I move forward. And I do this all the time. Like I constantly do this with novel things. And, you know, you just have to play. You have to play. And it, I, I feel as though if you're playing around, at least you're working. Right. Like it's one of those things where if you're if there is a something difficult to understand, and I, I think about like politics, rather whether it's it's on the right or on the left, or you, and you want to be in the middle and it's just hard to determine where you want to be. The fact that you're thinking about it, talking about it, and doing research is the best that you can do, even though you might not be closer to determining where you want to be. And that's how I feel in training man, I don't know what to do. I don't know exactly. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to play with this. I'm, you know, I'm playing around. I'm, I'm moving. At least I'm doing something. And not only that, I'm consistently doing it. And I've been consistently doing it for the past 16 years of my life. And I don't see that changing ever. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And, and, you know, consistency over long time horizons is going to produce results one way or another. Um, and so if, if people can stick with, with at least the foundational element of, of going after whatever their athletic pursuit is, uh, I think they'll be pretty pleased with the results. And that, that aspect of, of play is a, a pretty interesting, um, component because it's like, I'm sure, you know, as a coach, like not every athlete responds to the same stimulus the same way. And like certain things can yield progress for certain people. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I thought about it when you mentioned your first YouTube video that had any traction and you were getting, you got like the 25 subscriber notifications. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you never branch out, you may never find that thing that really works well for you. And then once you do find it, just 
just beat it till it's dead, man. Right. Hammer it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think this has been a great conversation. Um, I think that uh, hopefully it's given our, our listeners some, some, a lot of mindset perspective to think about the way they approach training or, or even other aspects of their life. And um, it's been awesome having you, man. We'll have to have you back and have a conversation focused on kind of like the nitty gritty of how to get stronger and focusing on strength training and, um, and chat about all that. But uh, for today, I, I think that we've given everyone a lot to think about. Um, thank you for taking the time to chat with us, Zach. If our followers want to find you, where should they find you at? Uh, just search my name on YouTube, Z-A-C-K. And then my last name is Tellender, T-E-L-A-N-D-E-R. And then on uh, Instagram, it is Coach Underdash Z-T. Awesome. All right. We will include those links in the show notes for everyone. So it's easy to find Zach. And uh, thanks again, man. And we look forward to having you back. Thank you.